In this final lecture, I'd like to uh, try to draw some conclusions um, in the light of the issues that we've considered um, in earlier lectures in this series. Let me begin uh, with a point that uh, we considered um, back in the first lecture in this series, which is the question, what might we expect constitutions to do? As I said in the first lecture, um, there's a variety of ways in which this question can be thought about, and there are a variety of answers to the question. Uh, but four uh, expectations that we might reasonably have of a constitution are that it will lay down some basic ground rules, that it will allocate and limit uh, state power, that it will uphold basic values such as democracy and the rule of law, and that it will set out and provide for the protection of fundamental rights. <clears throat> In the light of that, a number of questions arise about the British Constitution. Most obviously, to what extent does it meet those expectations? To the extent that it does or doesn't, is it merely the sum of its legislative parts? And, and is that a problem? Does that inhibit its capacity to achieve those objectives that we might have in mind? Does this mean that everything is essentially up for grabs? by the government of the day, given its control over the levers of legislative power in a sovereign parliament. And if that is the case, does that mean the constitution can't really meaningfully lay down ground rules and uphold fundamental rights and values because nothing is beyond fairly easy change? In contrast, to what extent does the constitution include deeper, more embedded, more enduring features, things that may condition, even limit exercises of state power, perhaps even exercises of power by Parliament itself. And there's a further question I want to introduce and to consider at the end of this lecture, which is why might these questions be particularly important today? I'll conclude um, later on uh, in this lecture by arguing this, I think they are particularly important today not least because we're seeing a breakdown, to some extent, in what might be referred to as constitutional civility. In other words, a willingness on the part of those who are in power uh, to play by such rules as there are. Well, in reflecting on these uh, issues, I want to uh, make use of two uh, central ideas, uh, which I think are key to understanding uh, how the British Constitution works. And they are firstly uh, re relationality and secondly uncertainty. When I refer to relationality I have in mind the question how do our three key constitutional principles relate to one another? Those three principles being the sovereignty of Parliament, the rule of law and the separation of powers. When I refer to uncertainty, I'm referring to the fact that uh, the answer to the first question about the relationship or relationships between those principles and corresponding relationships between institutions such as parliaments, governments and courts, the answers to those questions are themselves to a degree uncertain. And the understanding the place the role and the implications of that uncertainty is in itself important to understanding how the UK constitution works and to assessing its fitness for purpose or otherwise. Let me begin then with the first of those two ideas, the idea of relationality. Now, a traditional view of the constitution would, I think, look something like this. We would picture the principle of parliamentary sovereignty as being at the apex of our constitutional system and everything else would have to be, in a sense, inferior to it. Because if we take a, a very uh, literal, very orthodox view of the sovereignty of Parliament, then um, it is ultimately an all-consuming principle, a principle that allows Parliament, through its unlimited lawmaking power, to uh, navigate around or ultimately to remove from its path anything else that might get in its way 
and that might compromise the attainment of its legislative aims. Ultimately, ultimately, that means that if Parliament wishes to legislate in a manner that breaches the separation of powers, for example by vesting judicial functions in members of the executive, or in ways that would compromise the rule of law by, for example, shielding uh, the government from judicial review, then a sovereign parliament can do those things. And on this first view of the constitution, uh, provision is made for that by picturing the sovereignty of parliament as this uh, top principle, this trump that ultimately overrides everything that might get in its way. Thinking back to the different views of the constitution that we've been considering during the course of these lectures, this uh, picture of the constitution is one that emphasises its flexibility. It emphasises flexibility in the sense that it places Parliament uh, very much in the driving seat and allows Parliament, and indirectly the government, which of course will generally have a majority in Parliament, it allows it to drive through change and to um, not be uh, sidetracked or uh, disrupted by other things that may get in the way. Because we view uh, in this uh, paradigm Parliament as having an entirely free hand in these matters. So it emphasises the flexibility of the Constitution, the idea that ultimately it can't really be any more than the sum of its legislated for parts, because at the end of the day, uh, nothing is sacrosanct, nothing is, un nothing is immovable, anything and everything can be achieved by a parliament determined to do so. But I think that in the course of these lectures, we've seen that a different view is also possible and, and may be uh, normatively preferable, that's a matter of opinion, uh, but it may be normatively preferable, and it may also be a, a more accurate picture of how the modern constitution works. This doesn't deny the sovereignty of Parliament, but it recognises that Parliament sits, uh, and the sovereignty of Parliament sits, within a network of constitutional principles, and that our understanding of each of those principles shapes our understanding of the other. None can be in, understood properly in isolation from the others, because each takes meaning from the wider constitutional setting in which it is situated. And so if we think about the sovereignty of Parliament in this context, we can then begin to understand better and perhaps to reevaluate judgments which uh, critics of, 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 of the courts and of judicial activism as they might see it um, would, uh, would make. If we think about uh, cases where the courts have been accused, for example, of uh, going uh, too far and of compromising parliamentary sovereignty, that kind of criticism begins to take on a different complexion. If in the first place we understand parliamentary sovereignty as sitting within this wider constitutional picture. On this view, of course, the courts must take with um, the utmost seriousness uh, what it is that Parliament has legislated for. But in giving effect to that legislation and in interpreting it and deciding what it means and how it applies, it's only right and proper that the courts seek to give effect to the will of Parliament in a way that also pays due respect to other fundamental constitutional principles. If we think back to our discussion of ouster clauses in one of the early lectures in this series, I think that we can see precisely this kind of constitutional view emerge from the judgments. I think that if we consider a decision such as um, Privacy International, we see exactly this kind of thinking uh, being exhibited by at least some of the judges. The notion of parliamentary sovereignty is certainly not put to one side uh, in Privacy International, but it's understood and it's taken to acquire its meaning through its relationship with the other fundamental building blocks of the Constitution. On this view, the Constitution is not perhaps as endlessly flexible as the traditional view 
might hold. Because when it legislates, Parliament does sometimes need to navigate and even accommodate other fundamental features of the Constitution. This, in turn, suggests that the Constitution is not entirely a blank canvas on which politicians and lawmakers can paint entirely at will, because the constitutional landscape is not a barren one that can simply be occupied by Parliament as it sees fit. Rather, it's a rich constitutional landscape in which pre-existing normative values grounded in the rule of law and the separation of powers, as well as in the commitment to democracy that parliamentary sovereignty represents, all of those things contribute to the rich constitutional landscape within which Parliament then legislates. This therefore might change our perception of the balance that the Constitution exhibits between being endlessly flexible, as the traditional view might have it, and exhibiting enduring features that Parliament needs to negotiate and accommodate when it exercises its legislative authority. Whatever conclusion we come to on that question about relationality, however we see the relationship between these fundamental principles, I think it's fair to say that uh, there must remain a degree of uncertainty. Again, if one thinks back to a case like Privacy International, we can see that uncertainty uh, writ large through the different emphases that different Supreme Court justices place on the principles that were in play. Uh, Lord Sumption, for example, took quite a different view of the relationship between the sovereignty of Parliament and the other principles in play as compared, say, to Lord Carnworth. So there is a degree of uncertainty about these matters, however uh, we might choose or prefer to think about them. Ultimately, and as a matter of empirical practice, we don't really know for certain the answer to questions such as what if Parliament did seek absolutely um, unambiguously and determinately to undermine fundamental constitutional principles. Nor do we know the answer to the question, what would happen if the courts responded by doing the unthinkable, not merely by engaging in what might be regarded as creative interpretation, but ultimately by point-blank refusing to enforce a law of that nature. The reason for that uncertainty, I think, is that in the absence of a written constitution, and in the absence of these matters having been openly um, explored by uh, courts and by other actors, we don't really have a roadmap that tells us what would happen in these situations. One of the reasons, perhaps, why these matters are not openly explored, and are rather explored um, implicitly, and obliquely, for example, through judicial interpretation of legislation, rather than through outright judicial disobedience, is that both sides, I think, are conscious that this would be a very high-stakes game. There would be risks on both sides. It's hard to know, in the context of this kind of standoff between different branches of the Constitution, who would win, and how we would predict it. This point was made uh, very clearly by uh, Sir Stephen uh, Sedley, former Court of Appeal uh, judge. Uh, writing extrajudicially, he asked what would happen in real life if the higher court treated a withdrawal of their jurisdiction through an ouster clause as unconstitutional? In other words, what would happen if they didn't just interpret their way around the issue as courts have tended to do, but if they came out explicitly and said that the ouster clause was unconstitutional, that it was beyond the power of Parliament to do this. If that happened, Sir Stephen Sedley goes on, uh, the court might ignore the ouster clause. It might allow, for example, an asylum seeker's appeal um, in circumstances where the ouster clause said that the appeal shouldn't be allowed. In those circumstances, he says, the Home Secretary, not recognising the court's jurisdiction, because... Uh, on one view, the court itself has now overstepped the mark, the Home Secretary would continue with deportation. The court might then respond by arraigning the Minister for contempt, 
How would this end? asks Sir Stephen. We do not know, and he says most of us would prefer not to find out. So there is this great uncertainty about these sorts of questions because of the absence of any kind of constitutional roadmap that would allow us to navigate these sort of extraordinary circumstances with any kind of confidence. Now, the reference there in Sir Stephen Sedley's uh, remark to uh, asylum cases is, is a reference to um, the Asylum and Immigration Treatment of Claimants Bill, uh, which was introduced into Parliament um, around 10 years ago. And this contained um, a, a particularly uh, wide-ranging um, ouster clause, which generated enormous uh, concern among uh, the legal community and, and beyond. In a lecture that he gave uh, in Cambridge, uh, Lord Wolf said this about the ouster clause in the Asylum Bill. If it were to become law, he said, it would be so inconsistent with the spirit of mutual respect between the different arms of government that it could be the catalyst for a campaign for a written constitution. The response of the government to the chorus of criticism the clause had attracted will produce the answer to the question of whether our freedoms can be left in their hands under an unwritten constitution. This episode is a significant one because what happened is that the ouster clause was introduced uh, into the bill. There was this chorus of criticism, as Lord Wolfe uh, described it. And in the end, uh, before the bill was finally enacted, the government stepped back from the brink. And uh, it uh, significantly uh, altered the bill uh, to remove the most concerning um, aspects from it. So the response that there, there, there was to this um, in, in, the, in for it, relying on Lord Wolfe's comments there is that perhaps it did give grounds to think uh, that freedoms and constitutional principles could be left in the government's hands under an unwritten constitution because ultimately the government proved receptive to the criticism which was um, brought to bear on it. So Stephen Sedley goes further in his analysis in that he considers what would have happened if Parliament and the government had not backed down. What would have happened if that ouster clause had been enacted and if the kind of situation he sketched in his early remarks came to pass? What if the courts refused to apply the ouster clause and just said they weren't willing to do so? So Stephen says that in that scenario, there would be no winner, no famous victory. Even so, he said, it wasn't necessarily a bad thing that the proposed ouster clause had gone as far as it had. The government had realised that there were limits to what it could probably ask Parliament to do. Constitutional lawyers realised that the limits were less secure than they thought. But ultimately, the sky didn't fall in. And why didn't the sky fall in? The sky didn't fall in because in that uh, interaction that took place between government, parliament, judges and so on, prior to the enactment of the bill, a, an accommodation was reached. Uh, the government backed down to a large extent, although it still imposed significant restrictions on the relevant asylum appeals. But it didn't impose restrictions going as far as it originally intended. And by uh, stepping back from the brink, the concerns raised by the likes of Lord Wolf were largely accommodated. And this, I think, is an example of what might be regarded as constitutional civility. Of course, the boundaries get pushed. Judges sometimes issue very bold judgments, which uh, Parliament and government perhaps don't uh, welcome. Equally, Parliament may enact or the government may promote legislation which appears to threaten fundamental constitutional principles. That in turn may engender pushback from the judicial branch, either through the kind of extrajudicial comments that we saw there from Lord Wolfe 
or through the kind of interpretations that we see in cases like Privacy International. In this way, through this uh, back and forth, this constitutional dance, if you like, between the different constitutional actors, a kind of balance is generally maintained. It's a delicate balance, and the pendulum swims back and forth in terms of uh, who uh, may be uh, more uh, sort of uh, pushy in terms of pressing uh, the relevant interests. But ultimately, a degree of equilibrium is generally achieved. And it's achieved in the absence of a written constitution. It's achieved in the absence of hard legal limits on the powers of Parliament. Uh, it's achieved in the face of parliamentary sovereignty, largely because of constitutional civility, a willingness to step back from the brink. The question I want to conclude with is whether constitutional civility in the UK is breaking down, and if it is, what the consequences and implications of this might be for the kinds of questions we've been asking in these lectures about the nature of the constitution, and more broadly, about whether the constitution remains fit for purpose. Just to uh, expand a little bit then on what I mean by constitutional civility, I'm talking generally about a reliance on political self-control, a reliance on politicians and lawmakers choosing to do the right thing constitutionally, even if there isn't a law that makes them do that. One example of this is adhering to constitutional conventions. As we know, Constitutional conventions are not, at least in any straightforward sense, legally enforceable. Legal sanctions don't straightforwardly issue if uh, politicians breach conventions. But in general, conventions are or have been adhered to uh, in spite of the absence of a legal obligation to comply with them. And that's because of this code of constitutional civility, this unwritten understanding um, that the constitution requires certain modes of behaviour and certain standards of conduct on the part of those in power. This also extends to the legislative context. Here too, self-restraint is imperative, given that ultimately, at least on a traditional understanding, uh, the sovereignty of Parliament means that there are no legal limits on what Parliament can legislatively achieve. In that situation, in that context, the reason ultimately why um, abhorrent laws, constitutionally or otherwise abhorrent laws, generally go unenacted, uh, is not because the law forbids the enactment of such legislation, but because politicians, for a, for a variety of reasons, uh, choose not to enact them. But one of those reasons, I would argue, generally, has been a recognition that the constitution sets certain standards and limits on what is acceptable notwithstanding that those standards and limits may not be legally enforceable as again as the sovereign parliament. I think it's clear uh, that uh, in recent uh, months and years that there have been lapses in constitutional civility. I think it's difficult and I, I don't argue that this means that constitutional civility is in terminal decline but I think that uh, recent events at least uh, should make us wonder whether or not there is a deeper problem here beyond a handful of isolated incidents. Indeed, if we look back just over the last couple of years of constitutional practice in the UK, we see a number of worrying lapses of constitutional civility. Uh, the Internal Market Bill, now the Internal Market Act, originally included clauses that would have given UK ministers uh, domestic legal powers to repudiate the UK's international legal obligations under the Brexit uh, withdrawal arrangements. This was um, a direct affront to the rule of law, which requires the UK as a state and UK ministers uh, acting on behalf of the state to act in accordance with the UK's international legal obligations. The government sought to argue that it was OK uh, to engage in specific and limited breaches of international law and that therefore this uh, legislation, as originally proposed, was entirely 
uh, acceptable. So there we see uh, a willingness to dispense with uh, legal restrictions, albeit international legal restrictions. We also see a willingness to dispense with conventions. Um, legislation in the context of Brexit has been enacted uh, in breach of the uh, Sewell uh, Convention, which has um, significantly affected relations between the UK government and the devolved governments, and doubtless um, plays into broader questions about the uh, territorial integrity and stability of the, of the UK. We can see a different kind of lapse in constitutional civility, I would argue, in the government's recent response to the independent review of administrative law. As I explained in the second lecture in this series, in its response to the independent review, uh, the government has proposed a number of very significant changes to the law of judicial review that will substantially undermine its capacity to safeguard the rule of law. This does not uh, suggest a government which, is, um, which welcomes uh, judicial oversight and which accepts um, the need for careful judicial scrutiny of its actions as part of the price of uh, being a constitutional democracy under the rule of law. A similar point might be made in respect of the extraordinary and unlawful attempt to prorogue Parliament for several weeks at a critical point in the Brexit process in 2019. In that context, um, the government effectively sought to sideline uh, not the court on this occasion, but Parliament, uh, in order to prevent it from um, unpicking uh, the Brexit strategy the government had set out uh, to prosecute. And a final example is the rejection, uh, quite recently, of the independent advisor on ministerial standards conclusion that the Home Secretary uh, was guilty of behaviour that could be considered to be bullying uh, in breach of the ministerial code. The upshot of that episode was that the Home Secretary didn't resign, but the independent advisor on ministerial standards did. As I say, I'm not suggesting that any of this amounts to a terminal decline of constitutional civility. I said earlier that the pendulum tends to swing back and forth. But it does seem clear to me, at least, that we are witnessing uh, something of a change in constitutional norms and behaviour, and that this may raise questions that need to be confronted. Two of those questions are as follows. First, is the traditional degree of reliance we place on political self-restraint still sufficient as a safeguard against unconstitutional, albeit not in a legal sense, exploitation of constitutional flexibility? And if not, then to what extent can legal aspects of the constitution be relied on to counterbalance the absence or the decline of that voluntary constraint? In thinking about those questions, and I'm not going to try to answer them now because I think that um, hopefully over the course of these lectures I have uh, given you the tools to come to your own conclusions about these matters, but in thinking about them there are two risks that we should keep in mind, two risks of going too far towards either extreme. The first risk is the risk of complacency if we are too confident about the potential of political constitutionalism, too confident about politicians' willingness always to do the right thing. Sometimes they won't do the right thing, and there will be a need for a correction. But that shouldn't cause us to go too far towards the other extreme. If we simply say that in, uh, in the light of, of, of the arguable decline of self-restraint on the part of the political branches, if we then simply rely entirely on court and judges to step in and fill the gap, then we face a real risk of judicial overreach, of institutional damage to the courts, if we over-rely on legal constitutionalism. So to go back to our original question that we began this series of lectures with, to what extent is the UK constitution malleable and flexible? 
And to what extent is it, uh, does it have enduring features that transcend whatever happens to have been legislated for at any given point in time? I think the answer to that question is clearly the UK constitution is an amalgam of these two approaches. Structural features such as the sovereignty of Parliament and the reliance on convention do inject a high degree of malleability and flexibility. On the other hand, as we have seen through a number of uh, examples and uh, areas that we've looked at in these lectures, the Constitution is not simply the sum of its legislative four parts. The Constitution does contain uh, embedded uh, features uh, that reflect fundamental constitutional principles. Exactly how deeply embedded and exactly how movable or immovable those features are is really the question on which that uncertainty I talked about before uh, bites. And that's where uh, some of the difficulties arise in terms of not being certain about what would happen uh, in, in, in particular um, sort of uh, scenarios in which the constitution might find itself under particular pressure. But to conclude, I think it would be mistaken to, to try to, to, to pigeonhole the constitution in one or other of these two potential ways, because the, the more meaningful question is about what the right balance is between these two constitutional approaches. To what extent is um, valuable flexibility and malleability appropriately offset and contained by more enduring and embedded features of the Constitution? What is the right balance between these two approaches? And is the current balance adequate? Is the current Constitution fit for purpose? That depends in part, I think, on how those who operate the Constitution themselves behave. For a long time, in spite of its recognised imperfections, the UK constitution has often been approached on a don't fix it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of um, basis. The question that I think we now have to confront, particularly if the breakdown in constitutional civility that I outlined earlier continues, is whether we're moving into a situation in which the constitution is broken and does need to be fixed. Lord Wolfe, in the remarks I cited earlier, suggested that the solution, if that problem came to pass, would not be in looking to the courts to engage in more and more legal constitutionalist control of the other branches, but that rather it would be the point at which we should think about whether or not a written constitution was needed. The British way is not to confront those big questions, but rather to muddle through um, and to hope that things uh, work out. And it's quite possible that that is what will continue uh, to happen. But it may also just be possible that uh, when we look back in five or ten or twenty years, it may be that we look back on this period as the point at which thinking about a written constitution became something that was a more pressing concern and that may even turn out to have been a turning point in the long evolution of the UK's constitutional arrangements. Well, I hope that you've uh, enjoyed these lectures or at least found them uh, useful. I just want to reiterate a point that I made at the beginning, which is that the intention of these lectures and of the supervision that accompanies them uh, is not to uh, try and get you to go off and read lots of new things and to uh, consider things that you haven't thought about before, but rather it's to encourage you to think about things in a more joined up way and to uh, think about them perhaps a bit more uh, carefully uh, by putting the different pieces of the jigsaw uh, together. I hope that these lectures have helped you to do that and I wish you um, every uh, success uh, this coming Easter term and in particular uh, with the uh, exams. Thank you.